This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. All right, buddy. Welcome to the Monday Night Raw review. We've got a co-host on that has not been on since uh, February in the infamous Sami Zayn and Roman Reigns match for the Undisputed Championship. That. Uh, w- was one that I don't think I'll ever forget, and I can't imagine being there live. But Thomas Franco, who attended live in Montreal uh, at the Bell Center, was uh, our co-host that night for the Elimination Chamber review show. And now, six months later, he's back. He's back to talk about a little bit of his actual Raw review from the previous week. He actually went to Quebec City uh, for Raw last week, but then we'll dive right into uh, this coming week. So first of all, Thomas, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me again, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm doing been doing pretty well um, since the last time we spoke. Uh, you know, obviously been keeping up to date with everything WWE since uh, you know Elimination Chamber, WrestleMania, and then onward through the summer. So um, I've been pretty I've been pretty intrigued with what's have been happening over the summer. Obviously, there's there's a lot to talk about, and we'll obviously get into. Uh, what happened last week and you know then what happened this week and what what's what what it looks like they're setting up for payback yeah absolutely and uh of course guys the payback preview and prediction show coming to you live later this week but uh let's just take a a bit of a rewind as we mentioned i want to give you a moment to talk about quebec city and talk about what it was like live. I mean, we're not going to go segment by segment here, but I, I want your thoughts. I want your. I want you to be able to have a platform to be able to to deliver some things that you remember from the show, some some takeaways, good things, bad things, and and the floor is yours. Yeah. So, um, well, first off, I think it would be uh, good for the listeners to know who aren't from Montreal or aren't from you know anywhere. They aren't familiar with this area of Canada. Um, so Montreal is essentially the island and it's its own city in itself. Um, and then you have Quebec city, which is about three hours. Um, I'm not too good with you with East, West, North and South. So forgive me, but I'm believe that it's like, I believe it is like three hours North of Montreal. And so it's three hours there, three hours back. So my friend and I, when we saw the tickets came out, uh, we initially went and bought them, and I they were like they were super cheap. They were like a hundred and I want to say a hundred and twenty Canadian, so really really cheap per per person. Um, and then we obviously we got to the arena. The arena was really really packed. Like usually, I was not expecting uh, Quebec City to be a huge market, but the arena was packed, and there were I believe it's ten thousand people the bell center in montreal is around 16 17 thousand uh give or take so you know it felt a lot more lively in the arena and it felt like you know there were ten thousand hardcore wrestling fans you know that that's what it felt like so the show itself was really good i think what stood out the most obviously is you can't go without mentioning Sami Zayn or kevin owens um they got a loud pop and you know it's fun. It's very fun to sing Sami Zayn's song uh, or the tune of it. And then I think the whole show was basically just, uh, you know, centered around the Judgment Day and Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, that whole thing going on. And they actually have that tag team match set up for payback now. So I'll, that's going to be very interesting because it's Priest and Balor teaming against KO and Sami. So that'll be interesting to see what happens there. But yeah, the whole show, uh, the show as a whole. I think was good. My friend and I definitely, definitely being there in person, you have a different bias. So I myself was very entertained. I thought it was a very good show. But, you know, I heard many people online or many people, um, you know, just talking about it uh, from watching it at home saying that, oh, you know, but the, the, the whole show is formulaic. You know, you have Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens main eventing against the Judgment Day again. So, I could see the the you know the downside, but yeah, it was a very very fun show. 
And you guys, as you mentioned, that I remember the pop last week for Sammy and Kevin. I mean, it was monstrous. I mean, I don't know if it was equal to the main event with Roman and Sammy at uh, the Elimination Chamber six months ago, but uh, that, that I mean, you guys absolutely exploded for Sammy Zayn, rightfully so. Um, and same for Kevin Owens, and uh, that that to me was the most memorable part, one of the most memorable parts of last week's Monday Night Raw. And um, you know, I don't know what you thought about the, and, and this is also applicable to this week too, the Shinsuke Nakamura video package that was done last week and this week um, with uh, him and the subtitles and all that. How, how did uh, the crowd react in person to that? And what did you personally think of the Shinsuke Nakamura uh, pro, quote unquote promo with the subtitles? Yeah, so I believe they showed it in between segments and they showed it on the big screen there. So my buddy and I both sat down and when when initially we first saw Shin attack Seth, I think it was the, the Raw after SummerSlam, we were both like, oh, like this is going to be a good match, you know, but Seth is going over. Um, but watching that segment, we came away from that segment thinking like, wow, like we really like what they're doing with Shinsuke Nakamura because... You know, like we, like you mention on the podcast all the time, and I think the exact same way, is like, you know, why can they not let him express himself more in in English in front of a live crowd? And you know, they they obviously have their reasons, but I feel like taking the heel turn and doing these um, these little vignettes or these video packages where he's speaking in his native tongue of Japanese, I think it really fits a heel character a lot better. Because that's what WWE tends to do a lot with these, um, you know, these uh, these people who come from different countries. They, they tend to turn them heel when they speak a different language, or they, you know, they're not like, you know, their their first language is not English. So I I really liked it, and you know, like when he talked about Seth's back, that's when I was like, oh, like they're trying to. Because I know that Seth went on Impulsive on Logan Paul's podcast and he talked about, you know, his back issues and he said, I should probably go get surgery. Um, so, you know, when he talked about that, I was like, oh, so they're like somewhat blurring the lines. That's really, really cool. So really effective promo, especially this week, too. And um, I really like what they're doing now. Obviously, Shinsuke has like no chance of winning on Saturday, in my opinion, but I do, I do like where they're going with this, and if they turn this into like a two-match program, I, I'd really like that because I think that Shinsuke deserves a really important and prominent program like this. This has revived uh, Shinsuke Nakamura's career. In just one video package, it has completely revived him, and that's how powerful those video packages can be, and more importantly, what a, the ability to cut a promo does. And, and I'm sure they were concerned about, well, we can't put subtitles. That would be so stupid. I would take the subtitles a hundred times before I take whatever they gave us with Shinsuke for the last four years. This was so effective. The subtitles, we all know how to read. It was easy to understand. His delivery, even though you didn't understand his, you know, most of us don't understand Japanese or how to, you know, if we hear it, we have no idea what he's saying. The subtitles work just fine. The setting was perfect. And the narrative of, of Seth Rollins' is back was something that I don't think a lot of fans knew about unless you listen to the podcast. And it was something that actually, while we think it's a slam dunk that Shinsuke is going to lose, and I, I think it's a very heavy favorite for Seth to retain, it did at least put that little seed of doubt in your mind of, well, Seth may, well, you know, that's a real injury. Eventually, Seth is going to have to get surgery. And if WrestleMania is six months away, seven months away, is the recovery time within that time for him to come back? And you're thinking, you know, I don't know. It, it at least creates a bit of a thought, uh, a little bit of seed of doubt for fans. And that's all you can really ask for in this program. But even if uh, Shinsuke loses here in, in a couple of matches, I think his career has been revitalized moving forward even after Seth. Yeah, exactly. And that's all you really want from a, a high profile match like this or even just any match in general is you want to doubt. You want that sort of doubt that the favorite is not going to win. So that's because we know that WWE is now going underneath this this path or going on this path, sorry, uh, with Triple H uh, in charge that they're going for longer time title reigns and they want the title reigns to actually mean something so you know that seth is going to hold this belt uh like probably past survivor series into the royal rumble and you know you so you know that seth is probably going to retain at the next two pay-per-views 
but it's always good to have that 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 little seed of doubt, you know. And they they did that really well with Shinsuke, you know, talking about. Um, I think it was this week he said, you know, I'm going to be the reason that Becky has to help you out of bed, you know, like getting super personal. And I think that's that's exactly what it needed. No doubt about it. And, you know, I can't say enough about it. And I'm looking forward to this match way more than I thought I would upon the initial turn by Shinsuke attacking Seth a few weeks ago. They have done a brilliant job with video packages. Shinsuke's changing out, changing costume a little bit, changing his demeanor, his body language, all of it. It's just like a light switch has flipped. And I am I'm way more excited for this than I thought I would be. So, um, uh, well, before we get to this week specifically and really just kind of hone in on that, um, I want to ask, you know, first was there anything that happened after the show went off the air or was it just kind of like hey uh thanks thanks for coming guys and uh drive safe so i'll touch on before what happened before the show started briefly too uh there was uh a match between the two main event tapings um and so one of the matches were ricochet versus madcap moss and ricochet was getting a lot of cheers from the crowd which i found which he's obviously the baby face, so he would get cheered. But I did not think the crowd would be that behind Ricochet as much as they were. Um, so obviously Ricochet won. And the other match, I believe it was Natalia versus Nikki Cross. And Natalia ended up winning uh, with the sharpshooter. Uh, so yeah, so that was that was pretty good. And then, yeah, so what happened after the show? So I, I believe they went off the air with Kevin Owens, Sammy, and Cody in the middle of the ring. And... Um, what ended up happening after the show was Kevin and Sammy, well, more Kevin because Sammy had his chance to speak, um, at the beginning of the show, sort of. So it was mostly just the both of them in the ring, but more so Kevin, uh, speaking in French. And so what they were saying was basically, I'll give you the gist of it. So Kevin was pretty much saying, you know, uh, I've worked, He's talking about his goals and his dreams and how, you know, he started off wrestling here in Quebec City in front of no fans in high schools, uh, talking about how, you know, and he went through all of that with Sammy. And then, you know, he also turned to Cody and he said, you know, this is if, if it wasn't for his dad, I wouldn't be here. Sammy wouldn't be here. He said, so, you know, I I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for for Cody and his dad and his family. Um, you know, he trained all of uh, like a good portion of us who are here nowadays. So it was pretty much to thank the Quebec City crowd to thank, uh, you know, because Kevin's family was in the front row, I believe. Um, so, yeah, he was shouting out his family. And then he also said, you know, this is not going to be the last time we come back here now, especially after having a raw, uh, you know, here in Quebec City. So, yeah, it was pretty much to to. To, you know, to cap off the night and kind of send the crowd home, the crowd home happy and kind of give his heartfelt message. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I know that a lot of us sitting here in the United States anyway, where every time he speaks French, we're like, huh? I mean, like, it's just because obviously in the U.S., like most of us are English speaking only. So, you know, when he speaks French, uh, we're, you know, it, it's just kind of like, can you somebody please translate? I'm looking for subtitles. But you can imagine he's saying something ingratiating to the crowd. And that, that's what he, you got at the end of the show. And that that's great to hear. Uh, and, and what you expect from some you know Canadian uh, natives there uh, and, and to to go home happy. Uh, one final question. And then, of course, you can you can give us anything else uh, regarding your raw experience before we move on. But uh, what about merchandise and like what were people wearing and what was the demographic families, young, you know, men 18 to 40? What what generally did you see? So in terms of merch, uh, we went up to a stand. My friend and I were first of all, we spent way too much money on merch the last time we went to Elimination Chamber here. So we were thinking, OK, like probably not going to buy a T-shirt. Um, so when we did go to the stand, uh, there were a lot of Seth Rollins t-shirts, a lot of, uh, Judgment Day t-shirts, I'm Your Mommy t-shirts by Rhea Ripley, um, a lot of LA Knight merchandise, a lot of LA Knight merchandise, and, you know, there were a couple of, uh, a couple of Roman Reigns t-shirts, not too many, and then obviously you had Cody merchandise as well, Sammy and Kevin merchandise, um, and then there were a few title belts, and that's about it, really. So kind of what what you would see uh, at any event, at any Raw or SmackDown nowadays. So, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of selection, 
but there were, you know, there was, I was thinking for a second, I'm like, oh, maybe I should go and get an LA Knight t-shirt, but um, I could probably go and get that on uh, WWE shop and pay a little bit less because they do charge you a lot more when you're there. So yeah, that was in terms of merch. Um, in terms of demographic, I know my friend and I, we sat, it's weird, we sat in between these guys who looked like they were about 30 to 40s. They're, they were in their 30 to 40s. It was like a group of guys. And then next to us, uh, or next to me, rather, there was a, you know, a father with two kids. Um, and the kids looked like they were between the ages of, I would say, like 8 to 12. So, yeah, it seemed like there were a lot of families, but also, um, you know, some couples... And mostly a lot of uh, 30 to 40 year old men. So, yeah, it was it was re really diverse, really diverse. I'm hearing that more and more. Everyone I talk to that goes to a raw event is telling me, you know, you, you, everyone thinks of a wrestling fan as the, you know, it's the male 18 to 40 demo. That's their key demo. And, and, and in some respects, that's still true. But you go to the live events and you're seeing, like you said, younger kids, you're seeing a lot, a lot of females. I think a lot of the honestly, Rhea Ripley has a lot to do with the, it's kind of that female connection and and the revival as a whole for the women's um, women's division has been largely responsible for that. But uh, the mommy thing is caught on. But you're right. Yeah, it's very diverse. And that's great. I mean, I think that's great from, uh, you know, th from a business perspective for, for WWE to be able to not just only be concerned about men 18 to 40 that has been their, uh, you know, their quote unquote hardcore audience. So, well, very good. Uh, and I guess I'll just kind of uh, give you the floor. If there's anything else that I didn't ask that you just you, you wanted to you know let us uh, know about your raw experience last week. I think the only other thing that I could say that I was really, really excited about and super, super happy with was that the fact that I got to hear L.A. Knight's music and L.A. Knight walk out. <laughs> I think that's like literally I was during that whole entire Miz segment because I believe Miz, it was Miz cutting a promo. And like then he brought out Akira Tozawa and they had that match. And then the match is about to start. And I'm looking at my friend. I'm like. LA Knight's going to come out. LA Knight's going to come out. And he's like, no, he's on SmackDown. I don't think he's going to come out. I'm like, yeah, but the brand rules don't really apply anyways. So then <laughs> um, and then his music, I, I kept my phone on. I'll send you the video after, but I kept my phone rolling uh, throughout the entire Miz promo, but just like literally directed at the stage. Like I wasn't, I was, I did not have my camera pointed at the Miz or the ring. And then sure enough, I caught LA Knight's entrance and all you hear is me in the background just getting up like, like like crying hysterically you know so it was uh it was cool it's fun to see him in person um would you say he got the pop of the night with, with la night mm -hmm. well outside of outside of zane and, and owens yeah i would say outside of zane and owens it's probably between him um probably between him and becky honestly becky got a pretty good pop and the crowd started singing her song uh and then obviously you know there's Rhea too um so yeah, so I mean, I, I would probably have to go with LA Knight as getting the the the, the second biggest pop outside of Kevin and Sammy. That's awesome. And this is a this is a real movement. I'm excited to see where this eventually ends up with the whole yeah movement and everything else. And uh, we'll we'll dive into a little bit more of that on on the uh, this week's Raw side of things. And let's just dive into it. Uh, Sammy Zayn opens the show this week, and again from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, we got an immediate match between Damian Priest and Sammy Zayn. Uh, this one ended though with Damian Priest beating Sammy Zayn in 11 minutes. And uh, that's because Zayn was setting up for a haluva kick. But J.D. McDonough showed up at ringside. He grabbed Zayn's legs while the referee wasn't looking. And then Priest recovered and put Zayn down with a South of Heaven choke slam. So uh, Damian Priest gets the victory here. But after the match, uh, McDonough does pay the price with a stunner and a haluva kick. So uh, any thoughts on this particular match and, and, and the J.D. McDonough uh, phenomenon that's going on right now in the Judgment Day? Yeah, so the match was pretty good, honestly. I was pretty happy that they started uh, Raw with an actual match because for the last few weeks, it's literally been the same thing. as you know, Judgment Day or Kevin and Sammy promo. The Judgment Day interrupt. They set up a tag match. Like, I was getting kind of tired of that. So I'm really happy they started the, the show with a match. And I have no problem with Sami Zayn losing by a distraction. I think it was... I think you have to keep Damian Priest... Um, you know, you can't really have him taking pins all that much since he does have the briefcase. And when he does cash in, you want him to look as strong as possible. So I don't I don't really have a problem with that. 
the whole JD McDonough thing, I really, I, they started that a few months ago and they like, it seemed like they just forgot about it for such a long period of time. But now it's looking like really, really interesting. I really like how, you know, they have, so JD and Finn are close, but then, you know, the rest of the judgment day is, is all like, oh, you know, keep JD out of our business. So I, I really think from what I'm hearing, I I think they're going to get a split to where, you know, it's Damian Priest out and JD McDonough in. So that's why that, that match at payback is going to be so interesting because, uh, obviously, it is Priest and Finn that are tagging together against Sammy and KO. So, I it, and it is no disqualification. So I'm wondering, does JD cause any interference? Is is there anything any shenanig any shenanigans about to happen? So, this uh, this segment on Raw after the match, you know, it just kind of goes to show you that you know there there there's something that's going to happen. They're teasing something because you know why would why would Priest just kind of shrug off JD after he just helped them win? Yeah, there's there is no doubt that this match between Kevin and Sammy and uh, and Finn and Damian, this is not about the tag titles as much as they want to pretend it is. It's not. This is not about the tag titles. And we know that for a fact also, because just a week after that, they're going to be going to India to defend their tag titles against the Indusheer. So there is absolutely zero chance that Kevin and Sammy lose the belts here. Um, and it's, I mean, this is all, like you said, it's about a JD McDonough furthering of the storyline. He's trying to endear himself to um, endear himself to the judgment day. And you're right. It, it's going to result in some kind of massive turn, whether it's JD turning on Finn and Finn's out and, and uh, JD's in, or maybe JD actually finally endears himself and he gets added. Or the third option is what you said is JD's in and priest is out. So there, there are three options here. One of them is going to take place at the, uh, at the event on Saturday. So that that's exactly right. That's exactly where this is going. That's the purpose of this match. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the match itself was really good. So, I mean, you know, you're never going to have a bad match when you have uh, Damian Priest and Sami Zayn. So the the only thing I'd probably say is I'd like to see um, I'd like to see J.D. McDonough get in more matches. But I guess that for, for right now, it's not necessarily a priority. But he is really good from whenever I, I do watch NXT, because I'll, I'll admit I don't want watch NXT a lot but every single every now and again I I kind of tune in and I've seen him especially from last year I've seen him versus Braun Breaker and that program was really really good like JD McDonough puts on great matches so as long as they you know they have a plan for him and they let him kind of show what he's capable of I, I, I think he's destined for great things all right. Well, very good. Uh, I guess this next segment here is not really a in-ring uh, segment, but I, I do want to ask you, I'm not going to go through every little backstage segment, but this one is important to me because people have been speculating, including myself, about a turn for McIntyre turning heel. And it seems right now that with Riddle always playing like the little brother that's annoying, but you can't help but love him. Uh, they're doing the same kind of thing with Riddle and with McIntyre that they did with Riddle and Orton. It's like they're trying to recreate RK Bro. Um, and and I, I, I would imagine this is going to end in a McIntyre heel turn because Riddle was talking about getting matching kilts and Riddle suggested they get ringside seats for New Day versus Viking Raiders. Um, it, it just seems like it's either they're trying to catch a lightning in a bottle twice with Riddle and McIntyre, which I hope they don't, because I think, honestly, McIntyre is above this right now. McIntyre needs to be in the main event. But that's another, I guess, conversation. I, my question to you is, do you think this is leading to a heel turn of McIntyre turning on Riddle and then eventually challenging Seth down the line? Or do you think they're actually trying to catch lightning in a bottle twice with RK Bro Part 2, except this time it's McIntyre? I mean, I hope that it's the former. I hope that it's Drew McIntyre, Drew McIntyre turning heel. Um, but what this also could be is they also could just be, you know, planting the seeds for eventually whenever Randy Orton returns, right? Like it could just be a, uh, Drew turns on Riddle, he's beating him up, whatever. And then Randy Orton comes back. So that also could be a possibility, but yeah, like, like you said, I think they need to like, this is not bad. This is kind of like a holding pattern for Drew, but Drew is definitely above this. Like, I do think they... They longer term, they need to find a way to build them back up to where he is back in the main event picture. 
Um, and you know, Riddle, it, it's funny because last year Riddle had that coming off of when it, when they took Randy Orton off TV. Um, you know, Riddle had that program with the Bloodline, and he took on Roman Reigns, and that was like one of the best TV matches I've seen in a long time uh, with Roman. Reigns on SmackDown. I think it was like Roman's first defense since WrestleMania of last year. So you know, it's crazy to see how far Riddle has fallen. And then even the program with Seth, he had some really good matches. And now uh, I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see what they have for him. I don't think they, they see anything for him going forward. So uh, he's kind of lost without Randy Orton. And so like you said, maybe they, that would be my guess is they are trying to rekindle that sort of uh, spark that they had with Randy Orton and Riddle with Drew McIntyre and Riddle. Yeah, that could be, you know, honestly, it could just be them trying to find something for Riddle to do. There is no turn coming. It's just that this is a temporary alliance until they find something for Riddle to do and find something for McIntyre to do. It really could be that. Um, but I, I think a lot of us are hoping that it's the turn that we've been waiting for for McIntyre. He hasn't been a heel in like four years since he was Shane McMahon's heavy, um, you know, obviously well before the pandemic. So like McIntyre as a heel is a lot. There's a lot there that he could do. Um, we already have top heel baby faces on Raw and Cody and Seth. I think they're going to need top heels to work with. And McIntyre turning heel just is it's a natural fit here. And it would be a lot of fun to see what that looks like after uh, after all this time. So, uh, all right. Well, the, the next thing was a video package. And that was Rodriguez, who was talking about Rhea Ripley and saying that Ripley is the most dominant woman in WWE except for her. And that if she wants or that if Ripley wants her to stop getting involved in her business, then she needs to stop taking advantage of her strength and size. Now, I, I, I that to me was like an asinine statement. It's like asking somebody, hey, don't play to your strengths. Uh, do things that you're not good at. That, that, that was a weird statement. It was like Rodriguez telling Ripley to stop using her strength and size. Like, why? I mean, like, that's how you would win. That's how you win matches. That's, I mean, it just, it was bizarre. Um, but outside of that, um, I thought the promo was fine. She said she wants to show Ripley what it's like to be at the mercy of someone who's bigger and stronger. Hilariously, the I irony of that statement is now Rodriguez is saying, well, I can use my strength and size, you know, uh, to my advantage, but you can't. It, it was very, th that was a very weird thing. Um, but uh, she says she's going to, quote, cut uh, her down to size, Ripley, that is, at payback. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this promo? Yeah, I mean, like, this promo is kind of, it was whatever for me. I, I think it's just, it's it's a way for them to kind of make Raquel seem imposing and like an actual threat to Rhea, right? Be because we know that Rhea is not losing at least until WrestleMania. She's not, uh, the world, the women's world title, that is. Um, so I think they just they have a, a lack of contenders for that title on Raw. So they really do need to do everything they can uh, with Raquel Rodriguez uh, to make her look like a credible threat and at least be on Rhea's level. Because from a like from a physical standpoint, she or a physical stature, you know, she is on Rhea Ripley's level, if not if not you know bigger and stronger. So. You know, this this match makes a lot of sense. I'm really happy that we're getting this match on Saturday um, because, in my opinion, they could have had this at, like, a SummerSlam. They could have had this at, like, a Survivor Series, you know, that sort of pay-per-view. So it it's going to be a good match, but, you know, the, the, the promo just seemed really – just seemed really scripted and really forced. I don't know. It's not really – I don't. I don't like these sort of promos that Raquel Rodriguez cuts because I don't believe them. That's just. That's just where I'm coming from. Like I think she's just much better suited as a heel. She's been on an uphill battle the moment that she they they uh, put her on paper as a baby face, and they have she has been climbing uphill when they should just go with the current and go with the fact that she is a born heel. I mean, sure, down the line, I think she could be a, a baby face, but. She is a heel. She can't help it. She's always posing and flexing and like she is a physically intimidating woman. Her She's always smiling, which is super annoying. She's got just kind of this arrogance about her and I don't think she can help it. And it's just much better suited as a, as a heel. When you even when she came out and attacked Ripley later in the show, it, it was just kind of like this mediocre just very mild reaction from the crowd. Uh, people were not that excited to see, you know, uh, see her come out and beat up Rhea Ripley. 
I believe I even heard some boos. It, it was just, it was, it's not good. It, it's a sign to WWE of, hey, uh, it, it, it's not that Raquel's not a good talent. She has the look. She's a, obviously, a, you know, a, a force to be reckoned with. But she belongs a heel, and that's just the only way it is. I think their logic is, well, Rhea needs people to work with. And I get that. And I, for now, I, I agree with why they're keeping her a baby face, because Rhea needs people to work with. I mean, for God's sakes, they didn't even have Rhea Ripley on SummerSlam. I mean, how is that even possible that you don't have the most dominant woman's champion in, in modern history and one that has been on the ascent for six months, not on SummerSlam. She hasn't had a credible opponent from WrestleMania up until now. I don't count Natalia or Zelina. They're not credible. Raquel is a credible opponent. Is she going to win? Hell no. no. There's zero chance. But at least you're looking at it going, okay, This is a. This is. these are two strong women. These are two very strong women who are going to go at it, and it's going to be a fun match to watch even though you know the outcome. Yeah, and the other thing I'm looking forward to at the end of that match, I don't want to give a, I don't want you to, you don't have to comment on this because I know you're probably going to have to do your prediction show, but I'm, I'm really thinking that this is a setup for Liv, Liv Morgan to come back. Um, I don't know how far along she is in her rehab because I know she kind of, she came back from her injury and then she was gone again. She was written off TV. So I don't know how far, uh, she is in her rehab process, but, I'm hoping that that's what it leads to on Saturday because um, I think it would be really fun to see a Raquel versus Liv versus Rhea triple threat. I think that would be – that puts uh, – a nut, like uh, you're talking about before, a seed of doubt between Shinsuke and Seth about who's going to win. I think adding another person in that match um, between Rhea and Raquel, I think that makes it a little bit more intriguing to see if, if Rhea is really going to lose it or not because – I think if if done correctly, they could also build up Liv Morgan to that to that point where she's a credible threat. But yeah, overall, I do think that um, they're doing the right thing for now, which is keeping Raquel babyface because Rhea needs opponents, and Rhea has uh, done nothing in significance uh, since beating Charlotte Flair uh, for the title at WrestleMania. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that. That's I don't want to keep rehashing it, but it's just it's really a sore point for me. Of you have someone so successful as Rhea Ripley, you have a great story there, and I, I, again, I know that we're saying, well, she needs opponents. Why not bring somebody up from NXT or hell, make a trade on SmackDown? Like there, there are ways around it to help build new stars, and uh, they just haven't done it. Um, and it's just it's bizarre. Um, all right, well, moving on here, the Miz, the Miz segment. Uh, boy, did he he fool a lot of people even at home. Uh, the Miz came out to LA Knight's music. Obviously, the music got a pop until they realized it was The Miz, and he dressed to a T perfectly. LA Knight, he even mimicked his voice, his, his mannerisms, everything perfectly. Um, he said when he came out that the, the people will cheer anything as he's teasing, throwing T-shirts into the crowd. Uh, he says that's why their support means nothing. He said anyone can pander and called it vanilla and uh, Miz says he doesn't do catchphrases, which is actually the complete opposite of Miz's career. Uh, I mean, when you think about everything, you see he comes out and says the same things every week. When my hand goes up, your mouth goes shut. Welcome to the most musty WWE talk show in history. Like all, he says the same things every week, so he is a catchphrase, which is ironic. But uh, he says that when he says "awesome," he says it's it's the truth. Um, well, it can also be it, the thing is, it's not mutually exclusive, right? Like you can have a catchphrase that's true, but also a catchphrase. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but neither here nor there, I guess. Uh, and the last thing he says is that he's going to expose Knight to the fans. He um, uh, and then they won't cheer him because they don't cheer losers. Uh, and then he s- closed with a M I Z. Yeah, uh, th- this was, I mean, a-, a great heat draw. This was well done by the Miz. What did you think? Yeah, the promo itself and just the fooling everyone with the entrance. That was that was really funny. That was really cool. Um, I do think uh, the Miz has kind of been on the back burner and they've really been making him look weak and they haven't really been um, because, you know, he's not going to be a main eventer again. He's not going to be a guy that's consistently there, but you could do a lot more with him. Like, I really liked what they did with him at SummerSlam last year with Logan Paul. Like, if they could just, and that seems kind of like what they're doing here with LA Knight and The Miz, which is kind of like The Miz is playing like gatekeeper role, sort of. 
Um, and I th- and I think that's where Miz thrives. Like Miz is obviously generating a lot of heat. It's going to put LA Knight over with the fans even more. Um, so I really like what they're doing. I really like and the Miz is uh, when it comes to promos, you know, there's a lot of guys who are really really good in the business, but Miz is one of the best at promos in my opinion. So um, that first interaction they had a few weeks ago was 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 really good. Um, I think he bested LA Knight in that promo even too. So. It's uh, it's been really cool, and obviously I'm I'm pulling for LA Knight to get the victory on Saturday, um, which I think is probably going to happen. I'd be surprised if they if they they don't pull the trigger on it. But yeah, the Miz is the Miz is, is looking and and get looking better and gathering a lot more steam. I hope they they kind of continue with that, and you know they put him into more meaningful programs. They might, you know, I, I, I hope for the Miz's career they do, but uh, history tells us they won't. He gets, you know, he gets a bit of relevance and then goes back to doing some comedy or just being on Miz TV every week, talking about other people's storylines and not his own or getting, you know, left laying in the middle of the ring because he pissed off a baby face. Like they, that's been the majority of his career. And um, I'm very excited and, and anxious to hear L.A. Knight's response to this on SmackDown, which will be the night before the event. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, and I'll save my prediction uh, for the show later in the week, guys. But uh, let's get to the next matchup, which is New Day, which is Kofi and Xavier versus the Viking Raiders. And uh, this one ended uh, relatively quickly. Eric tagged in, and um, oh, I, I'm reading the script. I, I'm sorry, it wasn't a quick match. It was about 17 minutes. I, I read that wrong. Because this did not air on Hulu, by the way. I saw highlights. This was ex, uh, completely taken off of the Hulu version of, of Raw. So, um, But it was a 17-minute match, and the Viking Raiders beat the New Day. What did you think about this? Uh, it seems like it's just a kind of... To me, it seems like more of another match that they've been running with the Viking Raiders and every single program they've had, which is, you know, they've had programs with Alpha Academy. They've had programs with the New Day before. I remember right before WrestleMania, they had one with Drew and Sheamus. They do this all the time where they have the Viking Raiders trade a couple of victories. The other team gets a victory. The Viking Raiders get a victory. So to me, I was I was really surprised and went 17 minutes, first of all. Um, but the match itself was really good. Like Kofi and Xavier, as much as I know you don't like them, Kofi and Xavier are really, really good in the ring. Um, very good tag team. Um, great assets to have if you're trying to you know, bring up new tag teams onto the roster. Um, you know, in the sheer, I can definitely see them feuding with in the sheer in the future. Um, but yeah, like the Viking Raiders do need to, if, if, if the crowd's going to take them seriously, because as it is the, the, the Viking gimmick itself, I don't think resonates with the crowd. Like what is, how is the crowd supposed to react? Are they supposed to cheer them? Are they supposed to boo them? Like, because, as good as they as good as they might be and as as you know as scary as a viking might be like they're not really credible because they don't win consistently or, and they're not booked dominantly so um like to me this was a nothing segment it was just more about what happened after the match it was where or I'm sorry mid match is where Drew kind of was trying to throw uh, the chair at it was Eric or Ivar I can't remember who it was but instead he threw it at Co- at uh, Xavier sorry and then obviously, you know, the New Day loses the match. So it was more about that and more about um, Drew McIntyre and what we were touching on before. Yeah, you know, it did appear that uh, McIntyre was apologetic while Kofi was checking on Woods. And it could be more evidence of a heel turn. Was it was it on purpose? Was it, you know, was it by accident? You know, the, the, that story is something they, they could uh, they could use as a catalyst for that. Or maybe it's a, it's a nothing burger. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, look, I, I do hate the New Day, but I only I only despise them from a character perspective. I have all the respect in the world for their in ring. At times, Xavier Woods has shown main event level, uh, you know, uh, matches. And I have no issue with that. It's just all about the character for me that I despise. In ring is, is no problem. Um, and I've said that so many times over the years and um, I stand by it. But that said, you know, I, I don't want it to make of this with the Viking Raiders who have been hot and cold and cold and hot and then reinvented and then buried. It's very, very bizarre with the Viking Raiders. I don't know what to make of them, but I wouldn't disband them because the tag team division is just 
consistently weak because WWE almost never focuses on them on a regular basis. They it seems like they always need help in the tag team division, especially for the men. Well, for the women, especially, but for the men, too. It's it's never been a focus. They just by definition always need help at, at a, just like a baseline level. They always need help in the tag team division from a depth perspective. So the Viking Raiders, I'm fine with them as a team, but I, I don't know how to feel about them. And in the New Day, again, uh, you know, they they'll just forever be a tag team. They'll never disband. And that'll be their legacy, I guess. But uh, all right. So uh, I want to move on, though. Um, we did get uh, Imperium. Gunther came out and his new, uh, well, I guess, consistent uh, platform for his promo seems to be standing on the announcer's desk. And I, I like that. It's different. It's, you know, for, when he did it at first, I'm like, Oh, it's just a one-time thing. And now he's doing it every week. And I'm, I, I like it. I don't know why I like it. Maybe it's just because it's different, but he said that Gable made history last week by becoming the first man to beat him in more than 500 days. But he said it was by count out and then Gable gained a victory, but he won nothing. Um, but he did, he did accomplish one thing and that was piss him off and that Gable will challenge him for the title next week on Raw. Now, why the hell it's not on the PLE? I have no idea why they do that. Um, this could be a, a really a just an awesome wrestling match, a pure wrestling match on the event. I have no clue why they're putting it on Raw. Um, but Gable, uh, Gunther said Gable would, wouldn't would beat him next week, nor would he beat his best man, Ludwig Kaiser. And uh, that's when we got uh, Gable, Otis, and Maxine Dupree coming out. And uh, we had a little bit of a... A verbal battle before we got Gable versus Kaiser. So, uh, what did you think about this? Well, first off, what I read on I read on Twitter this morning, I believe it was from Fightful or something. It they did say that the reason why Gunther and Gable did not make the pay per view was because Triple H didn't want to overbook the show. So, make of that what you will. <clears throat> but um, I honestly don't have a problem with it, it being off the show because I think what they're gearing up to do here is. You know, last week, I, I obviously, I saw that match in person, and what a phenomenal match, first of all. Um, those two, like, if you give those two, like, an Iron Man match or something, they'll knock it out of the park. Um, I really think so. Um, what I think they're gearing up to do is, by the finish of that match, it seems like they're trying to draw on the storyline, because they even kind of touched on it uh, in the after the match with uh, Gable and Kaiser, you know, it, Gunther looks a lot like he looks really frustrated with Gable. Like he looks like he's like, you know, how come I can't beat this guy? How come nobody in my how come, you know, any of my henchmen can't beat this guy? It's like that seems like the route they're going with this storyline is that Gable continues to have his number. And, you know, Gunther's going to get frustrated. And eventually, um, dare I say it, I think they might have Gunther drop the belt sometime in October, November to Gable, which Honestly, I'd be super like if you're going to drop the belt to somebody, um, obviously they had the chance with Drew McIntyre, but uh, they didn't. They had the chance with Sheamus. They didn't. Right. But if you're going to give it to someone who deserves um, a prestigious belt like that, um, I definitely think you can give it to Chad Gable because um, the guy's a workhorse, man. The guy deserves it. The guy puts on the guy gives or he he you know he squeezes everything out of the lemon that he's given right like they were giving him like five minute matches two minute matches like not even a year ago and like he was killing it so i think that what they're aiming for here is obviously this is going to be a multi-match program i don't think the match on raw next week is really going to end in a a clear concise uh decision and if it does i think it's going to be gunther winning by distraction um but yeah i really i really like Gunther's new style of his promos. I feel like, um, like you said, it's different. So maybe that's why I like it as well. But I feel like since he calls himself the ring general, I feel like it kind of makes sense that, you know, he thinks highly of himself and, and, and why else, who else would really get up on, you know, the announce table um, if they weren't, you know, self-absorbed or they're trying to, you know, make a statement, they're trying to get people to, you know, acknowledge them, pardon the pun. So, um, I, yeah, I really like it. And I really think that, you know, the guy, the, without trying to get too far off topic, the guy's going to be a future world champion. 
Um, you know, uh, it's just a matter of time. And, you know, Gable, Gable will probably win the belt sometime. I'm, I don't think it's within the next month or so, but I think he has a strong case of winning it, um, you know, October, November time. There's no doubt about it that uh, you know, Gunther is headed towards, like you say, he is a world future world champion. He could eventually challenge Seth. It's going to depend on how long that they want to uh, keep Gunther versus Seth out of the equation. And also, uh, when does Seth actually need the surgery? Like th- this is a, this is something that's inevitable. This back isn't going to heal itself. So can Seth make it to WrestleMania 40? Is that his target? And then he's t- he'll take time off after 40 and drop it to Gunther there. But, you know, the rumors of Gunther versus Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 40, of course, we can get into all that, but we won't. Um, so just bringing it back to Gunther and Gable here, you know, um, I... I'm totally of the belief that we are going to have Gunther surpass the Honky Tonk Man's 455-day reign. I mean, there is just no way that Gable cuts it short here. You're not going to do it. As much as we all love Gable right now, and he is an absolute monster in the ring uh, You know, from an athletic perspective, and he's so, so, uh, sorely underrated, I was going to say, I think that he's still not the guy to cut short a reign that you could finally tag on Gunther and that is a massive uh, highlight on your resume if you're Gunther to be able to say that the longest reigning intercontinental champion of all time uh, is Gunther I think that is a, a record that's meant to be broken it's it's an accolade that he needs so G- Gable's not going to win next week but that said I think Gable could win next week but win in a way that's once again not going to change the title. In other words, we can have a disqualification where, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, an inanimate object is used or Gunther gets disqualified because he uses a chair or Ludwig Kaiser uses a chair or something like that. I don't believe it's an ODQ match. So they'll once again get creative with Gable continuing to beat Gunther without actually winning the belt. I think that's the story they're going to tell here. And then, like you said, they could go to the next event, which I believe is Fastlane in October, in which Gunther could beat him there. And then after that, I think once he passes this record, I think all bets are off and Gunther is really up for grabs. That belt is up for grabs after that. And all, you know, and maybe he'll go to WrestleMania. But uh, as far as the match goes with Ludwig Kaiser, though, I mean, this was an 18 minute match. A long, long match, but Gable's matches never feel long. He just has a way of being able to draw you in and just be amazed with, uh, you know, how much of a just a damn athlete this guy is. And uh, I, I'm loving what I'm watching. And, and, and credit to Kaiser too, who I don't think gets the credit he deserves because we're all on the uh, Gable train right now. But uh, Gable did beat Kaiser by DQ uh, in 18 minutes. So what did you think about that? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on briefly the the Gunther surpassing the Honky Tonk Man's record, and then I'll get to the match. But I believe I saw that it is in about nine or ten days that he'll beat the record. So once that, he, he definitely, I agree. There's there's no way he should drop it before then. Um, but once that is done, all bets are off in my opinion. So I think you know, I think Gable, like you said, I think Gable will probably beat him at either Fastlane or Survivor Series, but. Yeah, anyways, going to the match with Kaiser. Yeah, Kaiser doesn't get a lot of praise, but he's had quite a lot of good TV matches with some of the the top guys or, you know, the, the some of the semi-main eventers, the, the undercard guys, right? He's had a lot of good matches. Uh, and Gable's matches, like you said, they never feel long. Um, but, you know, he's just such a great worker. Like, the guy... He's super athletic, super strong. And then, you know, Kaiser in there too. Kaiser, I think that guy too once I don't because I don't think it should be in the future where he breaks off from Imperium, but if he ever does, I think that guy has a very good singles career ahead of him. Um he's very, very good. The match itself, um, good. I think it ended in a disqualification, I believe. Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, they had Gunther obviously go in to, to beat them up. Gunther to go in to beat Gable up after. Um, missed. I think he missed the initial power bomb. You know, uh, Gable put him in the ankle lock. And then, you know, that was fun at the end. It just showed you that, you know, Gable has Gunther's number. Um, and I think that's the story they're trying to tell. And that, you know, Gunther is eventually going to get frustrated and he's going to get mad at, you know, Vinci and Kaiser and whatnot. But, yeah, like uh, not much else to say on the match itself, I guess. Well, good. Let's uh, move on to uh, the Shinsuke Nakamura and Seth Rollins 
segment that I thought uh, delivered again. And there, there were uh, some tributes that Seth made to Bray Wyatt, uh, starting his promo with Yowie Wowie. And then uh, there were actually fiend plates that he put on his world championship belt that uh, I didn't notice until someone posted it on Twitter. There's uh, like the, the fiend uh, logo or face is on the side plates of his world title. So that was a pretty cool tribute. Uh, and he said, you know, it's been a long week. It's been a tough week. Uh, obviously, I can't imagine as fans, we all feel sadness. And, and you know, but I, I can't imagine what the actual guys and gals that work and travel up and down the road with him and know his family and all that. I mean, it's, it's got to be just, a you know, an immensely tough time. Um, they also paid tribute to Bob Barker, though, which, you know, it's interesting. We lost Bob Barker, Bray Wyatt and Terry Funk all in like the same week, which Bad things seem to happen in threes, and that that uh, certainly was the case here. But uh, Rollins said Nakamura gave him, or should give him, what he wants by coming out and says he has to uh, say it, what he has to say to his face. And uh, Nakamura didn't come out, and um, and then a a video of Nakamura aired showing him training, doing some kind of martial arts. I thought this was also very effective. There were more subtitles. I didn't care. I thought it was just as effective as last week. It basically talked about destroying Seth Rollins and how he'll break him. He won't even be able to walk his daughter down the aisle. And then that Rollins body has betrayed him and he's going to put him out of his misery. And uh, Rollins removed his shades and said that that was it from the legendary Nakamura. We get a video package. You know what I want? I want to know what happened to Shinsuke Nakamura, the one that headlined the Tokyo Dome. I want to know what happened to the Shinsuke who lit the world on fire when he came to NXT. And uh, he said it's uh, uh, he, he, it didn't stand in the way of him becoming champion with his broken back, nor would it stand in the way of him beating Nakamura's ass on Saturday. And then Nakamura did appear, and he kicked Rollins in the back of the head. Once again, a sneak attack. What did you think about this? Yeah, kind of like last week, very effective. Um, you know, I must say uh, my condolences to Bray Wyatt's family and all of his loved ones. I that was that news hit me like like none other. Like that was one of the guys that I watched um, just a few just about a decade ago when he when he first debuted with the Wyatt family. So I could just imagine, like you said, all the wrestlers that you know um knew him and knew his family and so I, I every every chance that they get to make a tribute i i'm i like it like even if you're even uh all of most of the wrestlers who had matches i don't know if you noticed this this week a lot of them had the wristbands that either said Wyndham or or bray or you know i i, I th- or i think it was on their arms yeah not wristbands but it was more on their arms yeah, yeah. i thought that was a nice touch um so yeah so seth having the plates i thought that was cool as well um but yeah like another really effective promo from shinsuke um you know seth it seems like shin is really getting in seth's head um you know seth really wants to 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 beat shinsuke so it seems like it's it, it's it's really intriguing me and it's getting me otherwise interested in something that um I, I wouldn't have thought i'd be interested in because like we talked about before you know this kind of revitalized shinsuke in a way and you know it's it's like I can't really say much else besides it was really effective, um, and I can't. It's it's. I'm really looking forward to that match. Yeah, this was again short, sweet, but damn effective. That seems to be the case right now with Shinsuke. And we we praised last week. This week was just as effective, even though it wasn't as long. But the sneak attacks from behind, and I love how Michael Cole pointed out the fact that uh, Shinsuke did say "Watch your back," and that's exactly what Shinsuke did this week was attack him from behind again. So he kind of foreshadowed what he was going to do, <clears throat> and then um, you know he walked away, but uh, he got the heat that was desired. I, you know, it's the match I don't think we knew we wanted, kind of like uh, Chad and, and and Gunther. It's a match we didn't know we wanted, but it's amazing what just a little bit of promotion and a little bit of video package can do in, in, in a promo from a guy that desperately needs to show that he can cut promos and we are we are seeing the format that works for for shinsuke and i love it do i need this every week from shinsuke no but i mean that that would wear it it's welcome but i think this is this is exactly what we need right now uh and it it certainly puts seth in a vulnerable position and does make you think again that little seed of doubt has been planted so all right well the next matchup we got 
Um, well, this was the, before the next match was the whole Rhea Ripley deal with Raquel Rodriguez. We already kind of went over that. Um, but uh, we did get the uh, the match of Bronson Reed and Tommaso Ciampa not on Hulu. It ended up with Tommaso Ciampa beating Bronson Reed. It, it seems like, I mean, I, 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 don't, I didn't get a whole a lot of reaction or feedback from the crowd on this. kind of seems like the crowd is a bit stale on both right now, and rightfully so. There's not a whole lot, whole lot going on. I know that these two, and when Shinsuke wasn't in the main event picture, was kind of trading wins back and forth with these three or these two men. These three were in kind of like a love triangle of sorts of just like, you beat me this week, I beat you this week. It's just kind of like I, I didn't know where they were going, but now that Shinsuke's been plucked from obscurity and put into the main event it's now just bronson reed and tomaso champa but tomaso gets the the victory this week and uh, your thoughts yeah yeah i mean the the crowd definitely seems like seems very mild on the two um i remember when bronson reed was actually again when when they came for elimination chamber and he was in that uh chamber match for the u.s title like he was getting pretty good reactions from the crowd um so, like, since then, they haven't really done a whole lot with him. Um, I know it's kind of hard to book him because he's he just debuted a couple months ago. Um, he's kind of a big guy, and you don't really want to, like... You, you kind of have to book him as if he's super dominant. And right now, you know, you know, Seth is the world heavyweight champion. You know, Gunther's got the Intercontinental Championship on Raw, and, like... You like like you say all the time. You have Roman Reigns on SmackDown, right? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna put a you're gonna have two heel champions on Raw. I don't, like I don't think I don't think that's gonna work. So he's kind of suffered by that, um, just kind of by booking decisions. And then Tommaso Ciampa, he's a a fan favorite from his NXT days. Uh, but just like the way they're the way they're they're bringing him on, it seems like they're doing the slow burn with him and they're trying to acclimatize him with the fans and. Get him, try and get him over in some way. But yeah, the match itself, the match itself was pretty good. Um, you know, Tommaso Ciampa obviously getting the win. I think he needs to continue to get wins um, and you know build himself back, back up to where he used to be in his NXT days. Um, Triple H is booking the show, so I don't see why he can't get back there because you know Triple H had a, a hand in Tommaso Ciampa in his NXT days, so. Yeah, overall, I think these two guys are kind of in a holding pattern, kind of like what Shinsuke was uh, before they turned him heel. Um, so I'm I'm interested to see what they have for these guys in the future. Yeah, there's just uh, not a path for them right now. Like you said, it's just kind of like they, they are. They're in a holding pattern. They're getting minutes in front of the crowd. That's important. But we don't know who and what they are right now. We know they can both go. We know Bronson Reed's intimidating. We know Tommaso Champ is a machine in the ring. But we don't know really who and what they are and why we should carry yet. Um, so that that's the key. And I, I, I'm not concerned about them yet. They're still on TV regularly. It's just usually in a non uh, Hulu cut version, which tells you all you need to know right now of what they're what, do, what they're doing. But again, I'm not too concerned yet. It feels like Tommaso Ciampa has been really directionless since he came to the main roster. He's been in and out and he kind of heel, not heel babyface in a, 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 a program with Shinsuke, but not then. In a, he's been all over the place with no direction, but in time, I think he will find something. WWE will find him something, but uh, all right, well moving on to the main event here. And that was uh, Becky Lynch and Zoe Stark in the crowd though. They continue to show NXT women's champion, uh, Tiffany Stratton, who, you know, just she stands there and just plays with her hair. And, and like that, that's that's the extent of it. She's been doing this for weeks. I don't understand the, the meaning of this. Maybe it's just to get exposure of the I would imagine it's just to get exposure for the NXT Women's Champion and NXT as a whole for the for the brand. Um, but uh, it, it's just kind of kind of weird. It's like every time I see her, she's just sitting there or standing there playing with her hair. And I'm like, all, all right, like, uh, you know, another another blonde uh, to kind of fit in uh, with, with the roster. But uh, to be fair i don't watch nxt like like a lot of us don't um but that's why we have our nxt co-host so he, he does an excellent job that said becky lynch zoe stark this was a false count anywhere match i i enjoyed this you know for what it was and for the program that a lot of fans are complaining about being bored and and stale and overdrawn and overdrawn and all that and there's a lot of truth to that 
Um, the, the Zoe Stark Becky Lynch program is actually more interesting to me than the Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus program in some ways because of the way things have kind of fallen with uh, Trish and the, the build and, and that kind of thing. But this was a really fun match, and Zoe Stark is a star in the making. She has delivered every time that she's gotten an opportunity. This was also a lengthy match, 16 minutes, and it ended with Becky Lynch beating Zoe Stark, but it was also an interesting dynamic here, an interesting turn or twist where we got inadvertent um, inadvertent contact between Zoe and Trish. And that was interesting to me where Trish ended up getting hit by Zoe, both Trish or I'm sorry, both Zoe and Becky kind of stood there shocked. And that's when the manhandle slam happened and uh, one, two, three. But uh, that obviously is going to develop into something I would imagine at the steel cage match at the PLE. But uh, what did you think about this matchup with Becky and Zoe? Oh, when I was watching this match last night, I, I think I had messaged in the discord, the discord chat. So um, if any of the patrons listening, uh, I just joined the discord chat. So I'm free to talk wrestling uh, every Monday and Friday. But yeah, I think I, I had put in the in the chat. I said I enjoyed that a lot more than I thought I would because the the match itself was actually really good. Um, you know, like you said, I think Zoe Stark is a star in the making. The only thing I would say she needs to to work on is her promos because her and Trish, uh, well, you know, Trish is not a very good promo in general. But you know, Zoe has some some things to work on when it comes to promos. But in the ring, she's She's very good. Um, I think as a heel, she's she's much better suited to that than than being a babyface. And I think Becky Lynch and Zoe could be something that they go into um, after Payback. Although it's kind of been like running simultaneously with Trish and Becky, so I don't know if they will do that. Um, the match itself was really good. The spot where um, you know, uh, I think it was Zoe. Yeah, Zoe ended up making contact with Trish. Trish. Trish fell off the production crate and threw the table. That was really fun. And then I think there was also earlier in the match where Trish was Trish was throwing um, chairs into the ring, and she struck Zoe in the face with a chair. That's right. So yeah. obviously they're 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 teasing something there for sure. Like I think maybe after payback, depending on how long Trish has left in this run. Maybe they do a Trish versus Zoe. Maybe they save that for WrestleMania, right? Who know? Who knows, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm really, I'm really glad that they're having the steel cage match at Payback because this program to me is like not believable. Um, even last week, all of us in the crowd at in, in Quebec City, we were chanting. Um, I'm going to say it in the PG version. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was basically them chanting, we don't care. Um, because, you know, nobody, like to me, the whole program is not really believable. Like Trish as a heel is obviously much better than her as a baby face, but it just doesn't seem like it's missing that sort of spark. Like it's missing, the, the whole feud is missing that spark. And I think a lot of people were saying, you know, oh, how come it got left off SummerSlam, you know, this, that, and the other. But in my opinion, um, SummerSlam itself like getting off topic, slightly off topic, but SummerSlam itself was a very well-paced show and each match got more than enough time. So imagine the pay-per-view itself was almost like four hours, four and a half hours. Like imagine if you had to add a Becky and Trish match, you would only be able to give them like eight or five or eight minutes, which is not really enough to tell a story. So I think that having this match at Payback is a lot better. I think... You definitely needed to get it over with as soon as possible because this has been dragging on since what? Like the the night after WrestleMania. So I think you should definitely put it put a close on this and move Becky on to somewhere more pro, more, you know, prominent. But um you know, like you touched on having Tiffany Stratton in the crowd, I think that would be interesting if they had Becky Lynch go to NXT and feud with Tiffany Stratton a little bit. I think that would be that'd be pretty interesting. So yeah, overall, uh, no complaints on the match. I think the match itself over delivered um, compared to what it, what I was, you know, what I was expecting. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to the steel cage match. I'm looking forward to see if there's any shenanigans or anything happening if someone costs someone the match. You know. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I also want to give credit to really not just these women, but everybody who had to, you know, had to had to wrestle and concentrate on a match when they were obviously very distracted over all the loss this past week. Um, you know, and, and, and to being able to focus on, I mean, I don't know how they do it. I mean, as fans were distracted, I can't imagine having to focus on, you know, uh, you know, the match at hand and put that completely out of your mind. It's nearly impossible to do. Um, so there is that element of that, that, uh, we forget about as fans, but, uh, back into the, the story. Yeah. I mean, this is ending at the payback event. There's just no two ways about it. It's just a matter of does Trish stick around for this? It seems like she might, given the developments this past week. Uh, I've been waiting for Lita to come back, and after she was attacked by Trish a number of months ago, we've all just forgotten about it. I haven't, uh, but you know, perhaps Lita does come back and even the odds and uh, take out Trish. Uh, you know, I don't know if they'll have a match, but and maybe that won't happen. But I've been waiting for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, th- that said, I don't know if Trish is going to be here after this. This may be her her run, her final run. I don't know. Um, but I think people are, dare I say, a little bit tired of Trish. And that's weird to say. But this story just seem this story with Becky just hasn't worked. It just hasn't. Uh, at least it's not the worst thing in the world. It just hasn't caught on the way that they probably had hoped it would. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the length of the uh, program. The uh, really not promos are not Trish's strength. That doesn't help. Becky hasn't got a ton of mic time. There haven't been a ton of emotional ties to this. It's just kind of very vanilla, and it's just not working. And that happens. But um, all right, uh, any thoughts on the final uh, match on Raw, or any other thoughts on uh, on Raw that we didn't touch on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no problem. But- so, yeah, so in terms of in terms of what happened on what else happened on the show, um, nothing really in particular. I just think overall, uh, it was a pretty good show overall. I think right now they're doing the best they can uh, to promote payback and make pay, make payback as big of a deal as they can. Um, with obviously, you know, they're they're setting their sights on next week too. They have the superstar spectacle from India, so right now they're trying to. Just do. I think, like like you mentioned with Anthony Demarco on your um, weekend review or state of the current state, uh, current state. Sorry, um, it's kind of that second lull period of the year, right? So they're doing the best they can. Um, but Raw, in my opinion, has been the better show uh, as of late because you know you obviously have the Bloodline stuff on SmackDown, which has kind of uh, paused momentarily, but. Even with the bloodline stuff, the intra family feuding, I um I was kind of sick and tired of that. And I think that Raw itself has a lot of good storylines. Like the Gunther and Gable storyline is really good. Seth and Shin storyline is really good. The the Judgment Day storyline is obviously the um the successor to the Bloodline storyline. So um, you know, overall it's good. And like you mentioned, you know, the Becky Lynch and Trish program. Um, I'm, I'm glad it's coming to an end because for some reason it just just hasn't clicked. There hasn't been enough emotion, like you mentioned, and you know everything they've tried just kind of hasn't come off. But yeah, overall it was a really good show. Um, there, yeah, there's not really much else to add. Yeah, I, I, and I'm you know I'm excited for payback. At that point, you know, we'll be talking about fast lane. But then from there, once we get past these next two events, we can go. Okay, Survivor Series is here. Now we can really start to hone in on here comes the Rumble, which means here comes Mania. And there's already favorites out for who could win the Rumble. Uh, LA Knight is at the top of the list, I believe, right now, although there are other candidates out there. Uh, in a, and maybe we will have the yes or the yeah, yes movement. Jeez, what am I? I'm going back uh, to nine years. Um, the yeah movement. Could be the one to take out Roman. We'll see. I, I know that uh, he's on a different brand, but that never stops WWE from whatever they want to just create a program. So, uh, yeah, overall, but talking about payback, I, I think it's going to be a great show. Again, full preview and predictions coming later this week, but I, I think it's going to be a great show, as always, from a wrestling perspective, which has been the theme in the Triple H era, has been eh, build, and then you come off of the pay-per-view going, damn, that was that was way better than the build suggested it should be. And that's been the theme more often than not 
for the Triple H regime of pay-per-views, uh, given even the lack of returns. And we've been waiting for Randy Orton, obviously, until Bray Wyatt was, uh, you know, taken from us. We were waiting on his return. You know, there, there's been a lot of ones out there, of course, The Rock and, and others that we keep waiting on. Despite the fact there haven't been any major returns, we continue to come out of every pay-per-view going, wow, uh, well done, you know. And so I expect the same thing coming out of payback. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know when they're saving certain returns to come back. I know there's obviously Big E and Randy Orton who've kind of been advised not to come back, but it just kind of seems too it kind of seems too good to be true that they would just give it up like that. So I, I think as fans we kind of stay hopeful and you know that they're gonna come back, that they're gonna be able to wrestle again. So we'll have to wait and see there. But like you said, with under the triple H regime, uh Pay-per-view builds have kind of been lackluster, and then once we get to you know the actual event itself, the matches, the in-ring are really good. The the storytelling is is phenomenal, and you know I'm so that's what makes me excited for Payback too. Obviously, you know it's a card that does not have Roman Reigns on it. It's a card that does not have the the you know the the WWE Women's Championship from SmackDown on it, um, and of course Cody is actually not in a match. Yeah, I think he's on the Grayson Waller effect. Um, so that's going to be a segment on the show. But uh, yeah, like for a show that doesn't have those three on the show, uh, it's a pretty good card from what they've from what they've been able to put together. So really excited, really excited for that show. And then, like you said, once we're past Payback and Fastlane, we're on to Survivor Series, which I don't know what they're going to do this year. Are they going to do the brand versus brand? Are they going to do the War Games again? I'd I'd hope they do the War Games again, but. Then after that, you know, you're looking on to the Rumble and, you know, there's, you know, there's obviously L.A. Knight, there's Gunther. Um, so a lot of guys that are that are in contention. And then, you know, you have WrestleMania 40 in Philly. So it's uh, in only a few months we'll, we'll be looking towards WrestleMania. It's going to be here before we know it. I know it's about, what, six, seven months away, but that that's not a whole lot of time. I mean, again, we look ahead, it, we're going from milestone to milestone. And given the fact that we're halfway back to WrestleMania nearly – you're already looking to 40, and I'm sure WWE is too. And, uh, you know, to say that Roman's not on the card, it's almost when, when you said that, I, I, I said to myself, I'm like, well, yeah, duh. As if the WWE has finally beaten us down to the point where, like, we don't even expect him to be on the card anymore. That's how far our expectations have fallen for a Roman title defense. Um, given the fact that, you know, he, he defended it at WrestleMania and then didn't defend it again until SummerSlam, which is just atrocious. Uh, I don't care what era you're in or whatever your your expectations are. That's just, it's not acceptable. But we've gotten beaten down so much that I'm just like, yeah, uh, I, I didn't expect him to be there. I know he's not going to be there. Like, we, we've just gotten to that point, and I hate that. I, I'm trying to knock myself out of that. I'm not going to be falling in line with that, uh, you know, that expectation. But it is what it is. So, yeah, overall, yeah, looking forward to it as as we creep closer and closer to that next big milestone of Survivor Series, we'll see what they do. But uh, th- uh, Thomas, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been, uh, you know, I can't believe it's been six months already since you've come on, but uh, is there any final thoughts or uh, any social media you want to share or anything like that? Uh, no, nothing in particular. You know, obviously I'm on Twitter and um, uh, you can find me on Twitter. I believe it's uh, at T Franks with, an, uh, with two S's. So you can find me there. Uh, I usually talk a lot of wrestling. I'm also into other sports. Um, but yeah, other, other than that, no, other than that, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, I'm, well, I'm first of all, I'm grateful that you let me come on again. Um, it was obviously really hectic and really busy last week. So yeah, hopefully in the, in another six months, I can go to another live show. Hopefully they come here sometime soon again and, uh, we can talk again. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, buddy. And, uh, you enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEPodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to Patreon.com slash WWEPodcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.